Oregon football's defense continues to improve. Best outing of the year away from Autzen Stadium. So which players are catching our eyes? Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster and lifelong Oregon Ducks fan. Thank you for making this your first listen or your first view if you're watching on YouTube of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. Like, comment, subscribe, please, and thank you. Wherever you're listening to or watching the show, a big thank you to everybody out there who has done so already. And yes, by the way, if you're watching on YouTube, I am indeed wearing another Mariners shirt. The day this episode drops, it is game one of the ALDS against the Houston trash can banging Astros. Yeah, I'm still upset about that. I will be for the rest of my life because they got one of these, what we call slap on the wrist. So. Oregon's defense, I thought, had a strong showing Saturday down in Tucson. Only 22 points given up. They forced a couple of turnovers. One of the touchdowns was in garbage time. I was really, really pleased. And that touchdown that Arizona scored at the end of the half, that was kind of fluky. You know, Oregon's sitting back in soft zone and, yeah, Flo and Sewell over pursue, and they shouldn't do that. You got to be able to make a tackle there. And uh, Bennett Williams, who I'm going to talk about as one of the individual standouts because he continues to to be pretty good. I think showed why he might struggle to make an NFL roster there. Didn't exactly have the the greatest acceleration trying to make that stop on the back end. But overall, I'm really, really glad he's uh, he's back with the Ducks this year. He, I, I could see him making a, a roster perhaps, but that's one of the things I like about it. He plays really hard. He doesn't have the most elite physical traits, but he's just smart. He's, he's just uh, really, really smart. But biggest thing with the defense here, though I see them improving against the pass. I like that the defensive linemen who continued to get pressure and Bennett Williams made that strip sack that, that led to a turnover, of course, one of two fumbles Oregon recovered and then had the interception. That INT, there should have been two because it's kind of a soft flag on, on Jaleel Florence, who I'm talking about a lot today on the show. I love to see the defensive linemen getting their hands up in the passing lanes. Jaden Delora is a good quarterback, but he's not the biggest guy in the world. And not every guy that Oregon plays this year is going to be the biggest guy in the world. And you can make plays. Dan Lanning talks about, in practice and in games, havoc plays. That interception had to make him smile ear to ear because that was a havoc play. You get a push up front. Arizona has a guy wide open. But Jaden Delore throws the ball and boom, deflection. Jaleel Florence, Johnny on the spot, makes the interception. One thing that's clear with this defense, though, as the season goes on, I expect them to continue to get better because any well-coached team, any well-coached unit, any well-coached player gets better as the season and on an individual level, his career goes on. Oregon's defense right now, much better than what it was through the first couple of weeks. If you remember, going back even to the Eastern Washington game and throwing Georgia out the window, I wasn't that impressed with Oregon's defense, but they got a lot better against BYU, and then they played a little better against Stanford, and then they had their moments against Washington State. That was before the Stanford game, of course, and this traveling down to Tucson and playing an offense that is capable of scoring points in this league to hold them to 10 first half points and under 25 for the game with one touchdown coming in garbage time. I think that's a really, really good sign. And that Arizona offense has got some real playmakers, but those three wide receivers, remember those guys who I talked about Dorian Singer, Ted Tyroa McMillan and Jacob Cowling. Those are three legit weapons. And Jane Delora is a guy who will win plenty of games in this conference. He already has, and will continue to do that. I think as, as Arizona's quarterback for the next couple of seasons. Those three weapons all held under 80 yards. That is a heck of a showing from the secondary. That is a heck of a showing. And I think in the first couple weeks of the season, I don't think you have that. I really, really don't. Now, one thing that's clear for this Ducks defense, TriQuest Bridges is just going to be in that number two corner slot. That's the guy they like the most, though Dante Manning had a great game. He's going to get some love here on, on the pod coming up. But we're just going to have to see how Tosh Lupo and Dan Lanning 
manage that weakness of the defense. Tricoy has had some nice moments. He's had nice moments throughout the course of the season. That interception against Washington State that unfortunately the offense couldn't capitalize was one of the best individual plays from a corner Oregon's had in the last few years. It was in, it was remarkable, absolutely remarkable. So he has some good moments here and there. His tackling, a little below average. His coverage, just okay. And I know a lot of people might want to see more of Dante Manning and Julio Florence. I, I do as well, but remember, much like with the quarterbacks, the quarter backs, same thing with the corner backs, these coaches are watching players all week long. They're constantly evaluating. If they saw enough from Jaleel Florence or Dante Manning to be the starting number two corner, they'll make the switch, and maybe we'll see that at some point this year. I don't think it's impossible. The only thing that I know for certain in the Oregon secondary is Bennett Williams is going to keep playing a lot, and Christian Gonzalez is going to continue to be the number one corner and the best member of the secondary that Oregon has, even though he really didn't have a great tackling game. Missed a couple of plays that he's been making all season long. I don't expect that to continue, but I liked what I saw overall from this Oregon secondary. I did not think you not only wouldn't have a 100-yard receiver of that trio of Wildcat players, you wouldn't even have an 80-yard receiver amongst those three guys. That's a really, really good thing, especially playing down at Arizona Stadium in front of what I was, be- what I believe was, until the game probably got out of hand, a sold-out Arizona crowd. Like, they were excited. There's a lot of optimism around that program. There certainly should be. But the optimism around Oregon's defense, I think should be there as well because we're seeing growth in areas that have been a weakness to this point in the season. Let's talk about Jaleel Florence because he is not great yet. Is he capable of being on the field? Yes, very much so. Will he continue to play this season? I expect that to be the case. He isn't great yet, but boy, he could be. And Oregon, looking at the secondary in the future, is going to need that because TriQuest Bridges, I don't remember what year he is, but we we know that that's a corner position that could certainly see somebody else starting as early as this season. But after this year, Gonzo is probably Gonzo to the NFL. So Oregon's going to need secondary players to step up. And I think Jill Florence can be that guy. I, I, I think he really could develop into that guy. What's so impressive about him is as a true freshman, He looks and plays like he belongs. Does he make freshman mistakes? Yes, he does. And he needs to continue to work on those sorts of things. There have been a couple moments this year, late in the game against Stanford, a couple times against Arizona, where he's getting beat and it's, you know, five to 10 yards of separation. But there are also moments like the interception that was called back because of a soft holding or another moment in coverage that he had going down the sideline where you look and go, man. That guy's playing his first college football games this year. He's never played at the collegiate level, and he looks like he belongs. And that's a really tough thing for a true freshman to do at really any position. You don't see it all that often. Kyler Casper hasn't really seen the field. He had his first collegiate catch, uh, I believe, a screen pass from from Ty Thompson, and he danced his way for, for four yards and whatnot. I think that guy could be a good player. I think he could be a solid wide receiver for the Ducks in the coming years. He's barely seeing the field. The fact that Jaleel Florence is seeing this action, not just in garbage time when the game has already been decided, but when the game is still closely contested, shows you the faith that the staff has in him, right? There's no injury over there. Dante Manning was removed for the game for for targeting. Unfortunately, he'll be out for the first half of the UCLA game. I think it's how that works. If there's an extra week, I don't know. It's all weird and targeting is dumb for the, for the most part. I'm okay with player safety, but the target, it's, yeah, that's a whole other conversation. Save it for another day. But Jalil Florence is getting out there regularly. And for a true freshman, that's a tough thing to do, right? You know who else is doing that? Josh Connerly, the highest rated recruit in the class of 2022. He's in there in that jumbo package. Guess what? He moves guys around and he's only going to continue to get better. It's really, really encouraging. What's not, is that we're cringing at the pump, we're getting eye-popping checks at our favorite restaurants, and inflation is hitting us all where it hurts, and it really hurts. That's why I started using Upside, an incredible app 
for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out with every purchase. I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. It's really easy to use. You download it, you go in, and unlike credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. To get started, download the free Upside app, use my promo code LOCKED, and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week. That's probably why they have a 4.8 star rating on the App Store. Download the free Upside app. Use promo code LOCK to get $5 more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more in the Upside app using promo code LOCKED. So Florence is a guy who is, is, I think, impressing early, has really nice moments, but is he ready to necessarily be the number two corner right now? No, I, I, I don't think so. But Dorian Singer beat him when he was flagged for a pass interference that was definitely offensive pass interference. I was really, really perplexed by by that particular call. But then there was another sequence in the game where you know he has those moments he gets beat or even on the interception, you know, he was beat pretty badly. He got picked off. And uh, some of that was uh, what was the coverage, which I'm going to get to here in, in a couple minutes. But then there are those moments. There was a third and 11 in the game where Dorian Singer is challenging him for a deep shot. And he is in perfect coverage. And that's a guy in Singer who's a good Pac-12 wide receiver. And Florence is a true freshman to show his chops to go toe to toe in moments like that, or the interception that was called back because of a hold, he's right there. And he's not playing because the coaching staff wants to get him experience or doesn't want him to transfer anything like that. He's on the field because they see the potential this guy has. And you give him another year or two with Dan Lanning and Tosh Lupoy and uh, Demetrius Martin, the secondaries coach, that, that could be an NFL corner one day. Not right now. I, I'm I'm not guaranteeing that, but he looks like that sort of body. He looks like that sort of player and shows a, a lot of promise. Uh, he also almost had an interception, made a great break on the ball on that two-point conversion play that, that Arizona ran after their late touchdown when, uh, when T-Mac was able to beat Gonzo, who had really good coverage. T-Mac just made a really impressive catch, and Delora threw, threw a good ball there. Um, but overall, maybe not Gonzo's best game of the year, and still, Oregon held Arizona 22 points. <laughs> that was a team that was playing with plenty of confidence already at three wins this year. They might stay there for a while because their schedule is about to get brutal. They've got Oregon, or they just had Oregon, Washington on the road this week. Then they come back at home against USC. Then they go at Utah and at UCLA. That could be five L's, unfortunately for the Wildcats. But the rebuild is underway, and that's a respectable team, especially on offense. And I, I, I just I, I liked what I saw a lot from, from Julio Florence. And I'm can, I'm interested to see how he progresses. Like, what does he look like by the end of the year? Is he someone who grows into that number two cornerback role? Or could it be someone like Dante Manning, who I thought had his best game of the year? He had some nice coverage moments, but tackling and physicality is where he was shining. And unfortunately, he was flagged for targeting and he just he laid the lumber on on that swing pass and. You know, that's sort of defense that that I want Oregon to have. I, I want them to be physical. I want them to be aggressive, make plays. It's just unfortunate. I will plug it for the one millionth time. Stop ejecting kids for non-malicious targeting plays. Just stop it, NCAA. It's so overly punitive and ridiculous. The NFL isn't held to that standard. Professional football players are not held to the same standard as college kids. We expect more from the college kids. In what universe does that make sense? Jula Florence is 18 or 19 years old. I think he's 19, whatever. He's not even 20. And we are punishing him more for an erroneous tackle than any NFL player who's 28 to 35 years old. Give me a break. It's absolutely absurd. But Dante Manning, for the first time, really in his entire Oregon football career, looked like a five-star player. That stop he made on the screen pass to hold Arizona to a field goal. Don't know how many people remember that, but that's four points early in the game that Dante Manning and the rest of that defense were able to make that stop was at an important juncture because it was early. It allowed Oregon to continue to build on the lead and eventually at one point be up 21 to three. But 
Dante Manning made that stop in an area defensively where the Ducks have struggled mightily this year. The quick hitters, the screen game, fast passes out to the perimeter. It has been a weakness. I was worried about it going in. I still thought Oregon would win the game, but I said this is where Arizona is going to try and be effective. I thought they could have done it a little bit more, but overall, I thought Oregon played really well in that area. And I thought Dante Manning on that play, that was the first time where he trusted his instincts. He read the play, diagnosed, went up, and made the play. And he was just faster and stronger than the guy who was trying to block him. And that wide receiver who caught the ball had absolutely no chance. I watched that play and thought, whoa, that's the Dante Manning we wanted when he came to Oregon as a five-star recruit. That's the Dante Manning we've been waiting to see arrive onto the scene. And it's a bummer now he's going to miss the first half of the UCLA game. And Jaleel Florence is probably going to have to step up big time. But if you told me, or if you tell me right now, that we're going to get Jaleel Florence as he is, and hopefully continuing to improve, and that form of Dante Manning with TriQuest Bridges, I feel a lot better about Oregon secondary. I really, really do. Because I think Manning has the physical traits. I know he has the physical traits and he has shown an improvement from what I have seen from him in coverage compared to what he's been the last couple of years. And so I don't think TriQuest Bridges has that number two corner spot locked down. I think it's just something you have to recognize that it's the biggest weakness of Oregon's pass defense and Tosh Lupo and Dan Lanning, when they're going through and making the defensive play calls over the course of the game, Lupo is calling the plays, but I know for a fact Lanning is in there talking to him about them. You have to give him a little extra help, whether that's sliding boss out from the linebacker position, dropping down Bennett Williams or Jamal Hill in coverage, or when Brian Addison gets back, whoever it is, you may have to give a little bit of extra help over there, but Would I like to see someone really firmly hold that job down and say, yeah, he's clearly better than the other two? I would. Do I care which of the three? No, I just want the best guy to come out and play the best brand of football he can. But I expect to see all those guys on the field. And you have other packages, too, where you can't have Jamal Hill and Bennett Williams on the field at the same time because they're both strong safeties. Right. So Williams does not have elite high end speed. Neither does Jamal Hill. Both are good tacklers. Uh, Jamal had a couple iffy moments in this game. Bennett Williams certainly did not. But when the other team is going with, you know, a four wide receiver look and you want to counter with with a dime package. Yeah, I would love to have Dante Manning and or Jalil Florence out there in addition to the two starting corners and feel respectable, respectably confident about how they're probably going to perform. I want to talk about Bennett Williams now. I talked about him last week, and I I mentioned that going into the game, he was one of the guys who needed to step up. He makes the strip sack. Oregon recovers. That's just the sort of player. He's just a good football player. He's not the most explosive athlete. He began his college football career playing junior college football. There are a lot of reasons that can go into that, but when you watch him, right, and he tried to run down that Arizona running back, I forget which one it was, on the long touchdown run, you go, mm, that wasn't the most explosive speed. He doesn't have that. But you know what he has? He's got it right here between the ears. He's just smart. He makes plays around the football. He's fast enough. He's a great tackler. He's a great leader out there. I feel a lot more confident with him on the field than off the field. And I think he's certainly played better than Jamal Hill so far this season. But both are on the field pretty regularly, just kind of depends on personnel and what Oregon's expecting. But the fact that you can blitz Bennett Williams, match him up on a running back, match him up on a tight end, he can go one-on-one with a receiver. Maybe not a really explosive guy like UCLA's uh, got Kaz Allen, though he's not used a lot in the passing game, actually. So like a Jordan Addison, for example. You're not going to put Bennett Williams one-on-one with Mario Williams or Jordan Addison of USC. It, it's it's not what physically he's going to be able to match up with very well, but a guy like Dorian Singer or T-Mac, who are not the most explosive athletes, Singer's a little bit faster, but T-Mac, you know, more about size or put him on a tight end or running back. He does a lot of things for for this defense, and, and it's a really great thing to see Dan Lanning and Tosh Lupoi 
utilizing his versatility. There's another guy who Oregon has had as a standout this year. He was kind of quiet against Arizona, but he's still really good. And I, I think we've always known that that he was really good. I'll tell you who that is after I remind you that our partners at Nissan have worked with us to create a new segment across the Locked On College Network titled Thrilling Moments, where we highlight the most exciting play from the Ducks game over the weekend or throughout the history of the University of Oregon. This week's thrilling moment from the team's 49-22 victory at Arizona, I am going with the tight end sweep to Maliki Madaba. I know, I know, it sounds ridiculous, but it was so smart. You know, line up in that jumbo package where you've shown you know, the quick pin and pull left, you've shown it to the right, you showed play action effectively against Washington State, and you just add another wrinkle. It wasn't the biggest play. Bucky Irving had a long touchdown run. The most thrilling moment was probably Noah Whittington's 55-yard scamper. That was a really impressive run. He showed great balance, lateral quickness, and, and some breakaway speed as well. But I tell you what, my favorite touchdown of the weekend was that tight end sweep. Never seen it from Oregon before, and Kenny Dillingham continues to show the multiplicity of this offense and the way he can get all of the Ducks' weapons involved. This segment has been inspired by the thrilling new designs featured across Nissan's new lineup of vehicles. Pursue what thrills you in the all-new Frontier, Armada, or Pathfinder today. Available now at NissanUSA.com. The other defensive player I want to talk about is Justin Flo, who I don't think had the greatest statistical game. It was a pretty balanced effort for Oregon when you look at the, the tackle numbers from this weekend's game down in Tucson. But when he makes plays, it does look different. Like when Noah Sewell makes a play, yeah, it, it stands out a little. But Justin Flo, when, when he makes a play, he didn't have any amazing stats, but the plays that he does make, you look at it and go, man, that guy's a good football player. And it's just a reminder, unfortunately, of all the, the untapped potential because of the injuries that he's had over the years. But if he keeps staying healthy, that's a big reason. Having him and Sewell there, despite their missed assignment on, on the long touchdown run before the half, that's a big reason Oregon has been stout against the run. Because if you're going to run a 4-2-5, which is what Oregon's doing, and I, I really like it. Andy Avalos had a lot of success with it in 2019. I've had a lot of success with it in NCAA football and college football revamped over the years. You know, there's a lot, a lot of things that you can point to where you look at and say, yeah, th this can be a successful defensive scheme. But at the end of the day, you have to have the personnel to match it. And I think Sewell and Flo are a really good combination there. And, you know, he, he did a couple nice things in this game against Arizona. So I really liked what, 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 I'm, what I'm seeing there when he's actually on the field. Uh, biggest area where the defense has, has got to improve, where they can improve, right? The, the number two corner slot, that, that's just going to be a, a weekly weakness, it seems, going forward. And you just got to be able to manage it, get around it and and make some plays, give guys help when uh, when you can. But the third down defense, again, not where it needs to be. And when I watched this Arizona game, I saw a lot of, what we saw a year ago, which is when Oregon sags off and plays soft coverage, despite having superior athletes or at least comparable athletes to, to Arizona's top tier receiving core in the Pac-12, probably only behind uh, USC's and I mean, Oregon's is pretty good, but Arizona's is right up there near the top. Every time you sag off, it seems like there's an open guy. Now, there was one play where they went press man and then Arizona ran a pick play. I, I I get that. And so they, I think, had a tendency to to not want to get burned by that. And that's the advantage of it. But the disadvantage is you just let receivers have so much space to operate. And I, I just want to see his defense continue to be aggressive. I want him to run press man on third and 11 and say, you know what? Here's a two-man shell. Come and get us. See, see if your receivers can go one-on-one -on -one with our guys. Now it is matchup dependent because if they're coming five wide, I don't want Justin Flo or Noah Sewell or Jeffrey Bossa to have to run with a, a wide receiver, right? Running back or, or tight end at, at the most for, for them. But I look at the corners, I say Florence, a great athlete, Manning and Gonzo and Bridges, like they should be able to run with these guys. And I just feel like you make it easier on the other team when, when you have 
a soft coverage that then backpedals for the first few steps. It's different if, if you got like a third down and eight and you have the guy sitting off, but it's, I don't know, cover two or, or a cover three of some sort. And you, you teach guys to come up because they have help in behind after starting off. I think that's a little different. And I think those sorts of things need to continue to be tweaked as, as the year goes on. I want to talk about the offense a little bit because I, I discussed Dillingham and all the praise I had for him yesterday on, on the show, which I'm sure many of you heard or watched. I thank all of you for consuming the show, however you are doing it and however often you do it, whether it's every day, whether it's every other day or twice a month. I appreciate every single one of you out there. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Please helps tremendously. But Bo Nix in this game against Arizona was back to the Bo Nix that we had seen in the previous few weeks. And that's completing passes to an array of wide receivers, right? Couple hits to tight ends, couple to running backs, couple quick hitters to Seven McGee, Chris Hudson. He hit the deep shots. That was the biggest thing I noticed from Bo Nix from the Stanford game to the Arizona game that was kind of a renormalization of what we've seen from Bo Nix this season. He's been completing deep balls against every team but Georgia who have the best athletes in the country on defense. That's that's just a reality. They do. But Oregon's gotten a lot better, and now we're into Pac-12 play. And Bo Nix has taken these shots. The offensive line is just awesome. There was this great picture of Ty Thompson handing it off to Jordan James, and even all the backup offensive linemen, Dawson Jaramillo and a bevy of other guys who rotated in, they all had a hat on a hat, as they say. Right, None of the offensive linemen were looking for someone to block. They're all hitting somebody. And what do you know, the hole opened up for, for Jordan James to run through, who I, I think looks good as, as a true freshman as well. Going back to what I was talking about earlier with Florence and Connerly and making an impact as a true freshman, but I digress. Bo Nix getting back to completing those deep shots is what I expect to see now. Right, like This has become a weekly ordeal where Bo Nix hits one down the field to Franklin or Thornton or Chris Hudson has continued to come alive, which I love to see because I'm, I'm a big Chris Hudson fan. He also is a, is a willing blocker. How about the slot fade, which is a great play. I am a huge fan of one-on-one slot fades. Not something we saw a lot a year ago. That throw from Bo Nix to Chase Coda, his best throw of the year. It was his most accurate throw of the year. It was pretty good coverage. It was a solid route, and Bo Nix laid it out beautifully into the breadbasket waiting arms of Chase Coda, who has been exactly what I thought he would be coming into this year. Not Oregon's leading receiver, but one of them. Reliable on third down, good hands, not a lot of deep shots, right? He's not hitting the deep post, but working primarily from the line of scrimmage to about the 15-yard range. He's doing everything we needed him to. And he's been such a steady presence. I'm, I'm a big, big fan. But, you know, the, the play calling has been excellent, right? It's balanced. It's smart. It's explosive. It's multiple. But you also have to have guys out there who can execute. And part of execution is coaching. My two favorite plays from, from the weekend were the tight end sweep for the touchdown because it was just so clever and so well run as well. But the play that set that up was demonstrative of the sort of player we've been getting in Bo Nix as Oregon's quarterback this year and how he's different from the reputation he earned for himself while at Auburn. That play was so tremendously well coached across the board. Arizona brought pressure and Sean Dollars slid across, picked up the extra blitzer, right? Stood in there. He's not getting the maximum volume of touches that that he could be to realize his full potential statistically, but he's still out there doing the dirty work. Speaking of dirty work, Patrick Patrick Herbert will do anything you ask him to do, literally anything, H-back, fullback, block, catch, whatever. He's got to get a touchdown at some point this year because, man, I tell you what, he will do literally anything, and I love those sorts of guys. But the play to set up that Maliki Montevideo touchdown, John Dollars picks up the extra blitz, The offensive line does their job, and Bo Nix doesn't panic, doesn't try to do too much, doesn't try to be a hero, doesn't break the pocket, doesn't give up on the play. He just looks and says, all right, blitz is coming. My offensive line's going to pick it up. Sean's going to slide over here and get the extra blitzer, and I'm just going to hit Ferguson on my hot route. That is smart offense, 
a lot of offense. Tom Brady is the epitome of this. Take what the defense gives you. If they're just giving you a little hitter underneath, go for it, especially in the red zone. But Bo Nix didn't outthink the room. He didn't force his legs into action. He just looked at it and said, and this is props to Dillingham for coaching him up for these situations and the entire team, frankly, for picking up what Arizona brought defensively and just cut. It doesn't sound like a lot, right? To the casual fan, it's you know just a five-yard completion to Terrence Ferguson. Everyone had to be doing their job well on that play. And it's one that can throw offenses and quarterbacks off their rhythm and force them into a mistake or an incompletion. And Oregon, a number of times this year, there's another play against Washington State where Bo Nix had pressure coming and just got off Dakota for a first down on what was ultimately a touchdown drive. Those sorts of moments make me feel really encouraged about Oregon's quarterback right now and the way he's playing and his completion percentage on track to be a season high at the midway point here in 2022. I appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.